Hello and welcome to News Click. The last few days have seen a number of stories leaked by The Guardian, The Wall Street Journal and The Washington Post about the, about the excessive surveillance being carried out by the US government. The National Security Agency, using laws such as the Patriot Act and FISA, has been tapping both telephone conversations as well as accessing data from internet service providers. To discuss the issue, we have with us today Prabir Purkayasta from the Society for Knowledge Commons. Hi Prabir, welcome to News Click. Could you please briefly run us through the contents of the exposés carried out by The Guardian and The Wall Street Journal? What, what uh, methods of surveillance are actually being used by the NSA? Well, the NSA has two things that it seems to have done, which is what has come out in public. One is, of course, the telephone records, which is what they've been called as the metadata. Now, metadata means that you're not listening to the actual conversation, but pretty much everything else, including where you are located, what's the duration of your conversation, what time it was held, to whom you are talking to, and so on. So it seems pretty much that all the information that is there, which is contextual, is being captured, and it is captured en masse. It is really the telephone company has been asked to provide it for all subscribers. And it doesn't seem to be something that is uh, exceptional. It seems to have been served on all the telecom companies. So we have to assume that the entire subscriber, what is called the metadata, the data about the transaction that the subscriber does with the telephone company, has been handed over to the uh, National Security Agency, the NSA. The second part of it is the what is called the internet traffic. Now, there has been an earlier case also where it had been, and still going on in the, in the US courts, that where the AT&T's entire traffic from uh, San Francisco, one of the switch rooms, was being given or diverted using a splitter and taken to an NSA room. So that, that meant pretty much what was called not a wiretap, but a country tap. Mm -hmm. Now, this seems to be related not to at t or the telecom com companies or the, uh, those who are the ISPs, but related to what I call the internet companies, which is Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, uh, and so on, Apple, and so on. Yeah. Of course, Facebook. Yeah. So essentially, it is being talked about that here it's not internet uh, metadata, but it is actual content or whatever you are doing that is being supplied. Interesting part is due to, again, various accounts indicate that a lot of the information today which is used in the intelligence briefing of the government officials come from this kind of data and it is said that could be anything between 75 to 80 percent of all the intelligence briefing today is based on essentially NSA snooping. It's also important to realize that this internet traffic that is being tapped is of American as well as non-Americans and a lot of it is coming really from what are called the email services. In fact, most of these seems to be coming from three, which is Yahoo, Microsoft and of course Google because all three have, as you know, large or extensive email services, Yahoo Mail, Google Mail and of course the old and trusted Hotmail. So you have this, this is the core of what seems to have come out. It's been pretty much what has been discussed for a long time. It's only first time now we have official confirmation of at least the court order, which is the FISA order, and what is being now is a, a PowerPoint presentation, confidential PowerPoint presentation, which says what is it that it was doing through internet snooping, what's called the PRISM program. Okay, now speaking first about, you, you said that they are collecting metadata, which is information about a telephone call. So what exactly can this information be used for? And why is it a problem that uh, its security agencies are examining this information? You see, obviously the security agencies would like to know who is talking to who. This is the key issue that they're really focusing on. So thereby building with other information it also has access to, maybe the credit card information, maybe your insurance information, your health information. If you put all of it together, you have pretty much a complete profile of the individual what he does, where he does it, and so on, who he calls. It also means that you all, suppose, let's look at it, you are a journalist, and you have access to government information which you have printed. Now, if I have your telephone data, that means pretty much I can find out who is the likely leak who has given me the information. Mm -hmm. So all the protection the journalist is supposed to have regarding that not betraying his source and so on, all that pretty much goes. In fact, it's interesting 
that this data that is being asked of is across the country, across board. While in the AP case, this is exactly the kind of data the Justice Department had subpoenaed or had actually tried to seize. And there's a huge hue and cry about how APs, uh, this kind of data is being sought for and how this is not good. Now, uh, here it is not one news agency, but it is across the board, everybody. So you can see that the extent of this is enormous. The other thing that you could see also look at, for instance, the government wants to know who the dissent is. If you remember the Vietnam Times, for instance, there were blacklists made of people who the government didn't like. Nixon had his own personal blacklist and so on. So here you can actually expand the list of people who are against you and then say, well, will he get a job? Will he get a contract? Will he get this? Will he get that? You can decide pretty much how you would like to handle the individual as a state and you can also blacklist him from the industry by telling him, look, we don't like him, so don't employ him. And this is what in the, in the 50s was the McCarthy era period. This is what was done across the industry, particularly the, the, at that time the film industry, people who were blacklisted, didn't get a job. So you have enormous potential for misuse if you know who the people are whom you don't like, who they're talking to. You can pretty much map what is happening. You don't need to know the content. By looking at who people are being, people are talking to, you pretty much have a clear picture of what the content of that conversation is. And then, of course, you can always ask for the content of the conversation if you want any further information. But these programs have been defended by various senior officials, including by the President Obama, on the grounds that national security needs require this sort of information to be collected in today's day and age. And also that there are adequate checks and balances in the system to ensure that civil liberties are protected. What is your take on that? Well, it's clearly the checks and balances are not working because the, the assumption that people had is that individuals may be targeted for security purposes, but not that every citizen's every record, transactional record is being stored and then processed by what are called data mining methods. So pretty much that everybody's everything is being tracked except the content is not being tracked of the conversation, but everything else is, was not something that people really thought was what was being done. So people thought it was targeted. What has now appeared very clearly that this was completely across the board and that's what makes it qualitatively different. And the kind of information also then is qualitatively different. It stays permanently. It's being hosted in this huge facility in Utah where all this data banks are being built. So this is in perpetuity. So what you have done in the 20s, can 25 years later, you occupy a position of power, somebody can use it in order to blackmail you in different ways. You can imagine, it was said that the Hoover, who was the FBI director, had records on every politician in the United States and used it for a very long time to retain his powers. Now you can imagine that this kind of data banks are going to be there in perpetuity. The problem, of course, which people are not realizing is that those who are powerful, they think they are the ones who can surveillance the rest. But unfortunately, as the Petrius case showed, that even a lowly person who has access to this data can then have run surveillance on anybody above him as well. So this is really an all-pervasive uh, intelligence state, security state we are building. And uh, we are coming into a scenario where at least in the United States, Big Brother knows all, not only about US citizens, but pretty much about every user of the internet. And that is a big threat. Because while we are talking about civil liberties protection for US citizens, mm -hmm. the rest of us who use the internet, who use Google, use Facebook, we have no protection whatsoever. And therefore, it's really also about the rest of the world, which is not what is coming into the civil liberties debate in the US, for instance. You've briefly touched upon what I think is one of the biggest problems when you're dealing with one of these issues in that how do you make people realize that it is an actual problem and could affect their lives? Most people don't seem to have any problem with either putting up huge quantities of information on Facebook or on the internet in general. And secondly, there's always a strain of thought that says if I've done nothing wrong, I have nothing to hide. So how do you deal with this sort of thing? Well, you know, you're raising really a much larger technological issue as well because it's not a question of what I'm putting up. It's also the convenience of using a smartphone mm -hmm. or a cell phone. The minute I have a smartphone particularly, I run various apps on it. This is WhatsApp application, for instance, which yeah. everybody uses for texting these days. Now that pretty much allows, the, through the internet, you to be tracked, your location to be tracked 
and it allows the intelligence agencies of the United States, who again are the host government, to pretty much track anybody they want anywhere in the world. Same with using Facebook. So the is essential issue is the convenience versus what I'm giving up. And what's happening, the convenience of the internet to do various things, willfully, we are giving up therefore our anonymity, if you will, our privacy, if you will, to these agencies. And these agencies immediately are not government agencies, but the telephone companies, the, the Googles, the Facebooks of the world. The end result is once it goes into say 8, 10, 12 companies who run the internet, and if those companies are accessed by the home government, in this case the United States, it's pretty much everything in the world then is siphoned into this. Now, can we prevent it? I don't think technologically it's possible to reverse that because we already have surrendered our anonymity and privacy to these companies in any case. So what we, what we can do is only looking at this, that how this data can or cannot be used legally against the people. Can we really protect the people against their governments. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we are looking at the US government. Let's not forget, almost all governments want this data, including the Indian government. And in fact, when the, if you remember the BlackBerry case, this was essentially the issue. The government was asking access for all SMS using BlackBerry. Mm -hmm. So, and it, it does appear that, for instance, the government of India, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, countries who really went after the BlackBerry. The difference being in that case, they wanted the possibility to access rather than access actually. What they said is you have to give us the ability to access this information. Yeah. Now, once you have that uh, possibility, then what is being done is known to BlackBerry and the governments, right. but not to us. Right. So for me, the possibility means the, act, you know, the realization as mm -hmm. well. I wouldn't go into whether they succeeded or not. The potential is there, whether they exercise it or they don't, is a different issue. I'm told that essentially that, for instance, the uh, messaging part of BlackBerry, mm -hmm. not, uh, not the one which uses the, the business, yeah, yeah. business uh, messaging part, which really is much more protected. But what everybody uses on the BlackBerry, that access has already been given to various governments in different countries. So that access is already there. And this, I'm told, is also true for a number of other similar services that, that are being offered. How much of it is being done in India or not, how much of it is being done in different countries could still be an issue because big companies like Google and Facebook can say, well, you know, we'll give it to the US government, but not to others. It's very clear that they are giving this access to US governments, but whether they're giving this access to other governments or not is an open question. And that's what the battle is all about. And to a lot of government, the issue is if the US government has this access, why should we not? Becomes a a matter of na national interest then in the large in their view of the term and it's also interesting a lot of the flag that has come on for instance when this major internet uh, conference took place which was really about that it was a telecom conference the, you refer to the world conference world, on information technology world, yeah the, in that case it was really about the internet as much much more than about telecom now, you've already spoken a little bit about the situation in India, but do you see such a broad and generic surveillance system being possible under Indian law? We've recently had um, various newspapers talk about a central monitoring system that the Indian government was planning to launch. Do you think this is possible in India? You see, at the moment, we are being protected by the incompetence of the government. Let's be very clear about it. There are multiple agencies who don't talk to each other, all of them trying to build similar surveillance platforms. There is listening uh, posts, if you go past towards Gitarni from Delhi, towards Gurgaon, you will see on the left, huge monitoring uh, you know, area being built, essentially for intercepting internet traffic. It's no, no great uh, secret. There is obviously a lot of effort to now look at the internet and how to access it. How much we will succeed is an open question, as I said, because of the competence that we seem to have, which is relatively low. It means the ability to get really telecom companies, ISPs to cooperate, tap into what they're doing, and with that tapping, use really, again, data mining methods to store, access, and collate that information. Unfortunately, a lot of this information collation and tools, what are called data mining tools, are being sold by private companies who are, of course, interested in their commerce. In fact, it's said that there is a, Palantir is a company which has developed these data mining tools extensively 
and incidentally the data mining tool is called prism and they're now a billion dollar company and it, if you look at the reports that is coming it's quite possible that's at least a part of the software solution that the nsa is using now is that tool available for the indian government to buy at a price Similar tools are available. Is it also possible for Indian government to buy those tools? So it's not a question that does government of India have the ability, but do they have the money to buy this kind of tools? And the argument is yes. In obviously, governments do have deep pockets and therefore they have the ability to access this kind of tools. And therefore, in the long run, we have uh, we are entering into an age where we are likely to lose privacy on the uh, in this digital world that is emerging. So my issue that I'm really raising is we should really look now how we can protect the citizens given the fact that privacy is probably not going to be there. So how would you actually go about protecting a citizen given that you've got states which have suddenly woken up to the, the fact that there is so much data that can be collated on their citizens, something as you say corporates have realized for quite a while and have based their revenue models around. So where does the citizen stand in all this given that the states seem to have absolved themselves of any responsibility for a citizen's rights? Well, I, I think this is, some, this is relatively uncharted territory, if you will. I mean, it's not something that is an easy answer to. Uh, part of the answer could be that this data cannot be used, okay, in a court of law. Mm -hmm. It does give still a tremendous power for black will in the hands of the state. So if it is proven that the state has used it, we could say people who have used it then should go to get jail. So one has to really now devise how misuse can be prevented. But the fact that this data is out there and it can be collated, I, I really don't see how it's easy to prevent it because as you rightly said, the, all the companies, major internet companies have built their entire revenue model out of collation of this data. Now, if you say collation of this data for generating ads is okay, but not for any other purpose, I don't really see in the long run how that will work. So I would say that legal protection, yes, political protection ultimately, is the awareness of the citizens that these tools exist and how their governments should not use these tools becomes in a matter of politics, not just a matter of law. So I think the answer to this is that we have to then get into the realm of politics, how this can be the misuse can be prevented and what laws can be put in place to see that misuse is punished by the government and the government officials and this use against citizens is prohibited in courts of law. These are some of the, you know, really uh, very nebulous ideas I would present. But in the long run, we would also have to accept that citizens, you know, uh, what shall I say, privacy by which we practice one thing at home and do something else outside. Mm -hmm. This kind of things are also going to disappear because it's increasingly impossible to have that kind of protection of your privacy, privacy by which you say, these things are my private domain and I'll not let it be you know, uh, made public. Like the politicians today don't have protection of privacy. The celebrities do not have protection of privacy. It's accepted that their private lives are public domain. Mm -hmm. Information people have a right to it because they're celebrities. Mm -hmm. If they come on public stage, we yeah, have the right to know standards what they're doing. For a standards. public figure. So I think uh, this is going to go. And what's going to really emerge is that everybody will have standards which are the same, which means that anything that you do in private is open to the public. This is technologically what's happening. So we are entering, shall we say, a world of glass houses. Thank you, Prabir. That's all we have time for today. Do join us again. We will be covering this issue in more detail. Thank you.